Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's planning meeting on a cold and frosty morning, Wednesday the 14th of December. Are there any apologies? I have apologies from Councillors Parker, Geoffrey, Goodman Bradbury, Nutley, Piet and McGregor. Thank you very much indeed. Can we note there's apologies with a show of hands, please? I, I propose to the chair. We, we don't need to. We don't need to yeah. have that. OK, yeah. fair enough. OK, fair enough. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> Item two, the minutes of our last meeting, which is on, on, available on page five and 12 of the agenda. Is everybody content no, with that? Yes, yes. Yeah. So, so I'm happy to propose through the chair that we adopt those minutes. And if it, second, second, if so can we go to the vote with a show of hands in please? Yeah, okay. Sorry, Councillor Coco. I wasn't here, so okay. That's okay. Yeah, so. I okay. So, okay. okay. But that's carried, yeah. That's fine, thank you. Um, are there any declarations of interest at all? No, thank you. Public participation. We have two members of the public that would like to address the committee today. Um, the, an objector is Mr. Mark Gilchrist, and then also the supporter is Mrs. Diane Nairi. Moving on to item five, which is my uh, announcements. Um, I think the first thing to advise is that Councillor Sylvia Russell was a reserve of this committee, but now she's been appointed as a member of the committee by her political group. So welcome, Sylvia Russell. Thank you. Um, I'm going to do some introductions now to let you know who's, who's sitting to my left and my right. Um, to my left is Sarah Selway. She's the Democratic Services team leader. To her right is Paul Woodhead, who's a solicitor for the council. To his right is Rosalind Eastman, the business manager. And at the far end, we have, it's true, I don't know how embarrassing this is now when you run out of names. Cheryl, sorry. I do apologize, Cheryl, yeah. Who's, who's actually the, um, the, the, 
senior planning officer, so apologies for, for bumbling on that one. And to my left, Christopher Morgan, who's the trainee democratic services officer. So we have just one planning application to consider today, and that is planning application 21, oblique 01352, oblique major, obelisk farm, Kenton. So I'd like to hand over to the officer now to present the application. Thank you, Chair. So the application before members today um, is Obelisk Gardens, Mamhead, change of use of land for the siting of 14 mm -hmm. holiday lodges, demolition of all the glass houses except for one, which is to be re retained to use as a winter garden, um, and associated access, landscaping, internal roads, um, decking and hard soundings. So if I move on to the presentation, just to let you know that um, three late letters of objection um, have been received this week that they don't raise any new issues they just repeat um, objections that are already set out in the report so just moving on to the location plan so you can um, see the top half of the site outlined in red is the application site the land below that outlined in blue is other land that is owned by the applicant So to give you an aerial image um, which shows to the north here, this is the registered park and garden. Um, so the application site is this area in red. So I just highlighted this is the area um, where holly tunnels used to sit. These are the greenhouses. There are some existing holiday lets here and some there. And that is the applicant's um, listed dwelling. So in terms of heritage assets, so um, the registered park and garden is to the north of the site here. The closest listed building is the applicant's own property. Um, and I've set out the various distances in the report, um, but these tri coloured triangles indicate the heritage assets within one kilometre of the site. So that's the existing site plan, so you can see it is quite heavily treed, um, slopes quite significantly from north down to south. You can make out here an existing informal track runs around the perimeter of the site to the back of the greenhouses. So this is the proposed site layout. Just in the corner here, this is the original um, proposed layout when it was 24. Um, lodges, it was reduced down to 14 due to the heritage concerns, so this area of the site here is to remain undeveloped. The proposed access point is in the top corner. This is the greenhouse that's going to be retained. So the, the brown buildings are the lodges. Um, this cluster here are the existing holiday properties. So I've just put up the drainage plan so you can see what is proposed in terms of drainage. Um, the black dots are existing septic tanks. So the three lodges in this corner will drain into the existing tank here. All of the other lodges here will um, drain into a new package treatment plant and that has its own drainage field. Um, Devon County uh, Local Flood Risk Authority and the Environment Agency are both satisfied with what is proposed. So apologies, this one's probably not terribly clear. Uh, it's just, it's the landscaping plan. Um, so the green areas are where there is new tree planting proposed. The purple is the existing trees. And the, the hashed area, this is to be managed as wildflower meadow. You will see there is a condition for further landscaping details um, to propose to strengthen the boundary, so particularly this boundary and this boundary. So the applicant provided some illustrations um, of what the proposed lodges might look like, so they are effectively sort of timber lodge designs, or designed, as is in the report, to meet the legal definition of a caravan. 
So this is taken from the applicant's LVIA, and I have used some photos from that because the photos are, are much better than anything that I could take myself. So, <coughs> excuse me, the pink area um, is where theoretically you would see the development from. It is quite um, well contained due to the vegetation um, and the landform. So moving on to the photos. So this, the snippet at the top here shows where the photo was taken from. Um, so this is the highway to the west, so the site is in here and behind the boundary. So you will get glimpses of lodges um, on the site from the highway. And this boundary here is one of the ones that will be strengthened for additional planting. So this is showing the proposed site access. The new access will be going in through the top here. Um, the bottom image is taken from towards the lane up towards the car park to Obelisk Gardens. So the site will be in behind um, that row of, of hedgerows and trees there. So the next few slides are just views taken from further away. So this is from the east. The site will be um, on lower ground, the other side of that hedgerow. And from the south, the access to the site is up that lane. So that just shows the vegetation is, is quite dense. It also gives you a, an indication of um, the nature of the local highway. So some further range views. Again, you can see here the existing greenhouses on site. You can glimpse them through the vegetation. Um, and similarly here, the site is in this area. And again, further from the southwest, you can just about make out um, existing dwelling and some structures on the site. So the site, as indicated, is roughly um, that area. And a longer view. Again, I've put a red blob there. That's kind of where the site is. So you can see that the vegetation is quite dense there. It's difficult to set long view to see any existing structures on the site. So moving on to some of the photographs I took. Um, this is currently um, how the, the proposed site access is. Um, it's covered by a fallen tree. So the top photo here, um, that is the tree in the corner of the photo. So that's looking down the lane. And that's from the same point, looking <coughs> up the lane um, around the corner, you have the entrance to Obelisk Gardens car park. And this is a photo looking down the lane. The existing access to the holiday lets is here. Um, so although there are no formal passing places on the highway, there are in terms of um, where the access points to the site are. So this slide, I've just done um, a quick route around the site where my next photos are because there are so many trees on site, every photo kind of looks similar. So I, I started um, in the bottom here and then worked around the perimeter of the site with a few views in and then I've gone around the back of greenhouses. So I'll just walk you through those photos. So this is the starting point, looking um, towards the greenhouses and some of the former nursery structures. Yeah, and that's moving around slightly further north. You can see in the background here, this is the greenhouse that will be retained. And moving towards the centre of the site, um, this shows you here the existing holiday properties. And this one moving um, along the western boundary. And then this is looking towards the centre of the site, one of the open areas where some of the lodges will go. And this is taken from the towards the top corner of the site. So the proposed access will be um, in the left-hand corner. This building you can make out here is what I've referred to um, in the report. It's called John's House. Um, and these quite mature trees here a part of the boundary with the registered park and garden. And that's another view of the centre of the site. You can see that the trees are, some of the trees are quite mature. 
the lodges will be sited um, amongst the gaps in between the trees. And this is from towards the top of the site. So this is the northern boundary. The access point will be um, in behind these trees. And then walking along the top of the site, so the northern boundary is up here. Um, you can see that's the existing greenhouses. This is taken from the towards the top corner of the site, so the northern boundary is on the right here. So that's looking. The access will be in sort of that direction. This is the track that I mentioned earlier that will be um, reused for the development. Okay, and that's in. Um, another photo to show um, <coughs> how dense the northern boundary is. Um, and that's, this is just moving slowly along the, the northern boundary. Um, I put this one in. It was um, one of the applicants' photos in the supporting documents. Just gives you a, a feel of what the site um, looked like when it did have polytunnels on it. So the polytunnels um, have recently been removed. This is taken from the top um, corner of the eastern boundary, which is just off to the left of the photo here, and you can see that's the greenhouse that's being retained. This is the area where the polytunnels um, did sit, um, and it's now going to be undeveloped. Again, that's just the top corner of the site looking from the other direction. You can see the remains of one of the polytunnels. And that is the eastern boundary, which is it's a fairly um, significant boundary. There are some gaps through it. So again, that will be strengthened through additional planting. And then just looking down, so that eastern boundary is off to the left here. And that's, again, that's the track that runs um, around the edge of the site. Again, the, this is towards the greenhouses, so the, the track continues down here. That's looking back up to the track. We're at the back of the greenhouses now. That's the bottom corner of the site um, with the greenhouses. So all of these are going to be demolished. So I thought it would be useful to put these in. There's, there's been some, some local concern mentioned by the objectors. Um, the history of the site isn't clear. It's been overestimated what what did um, take place on the site. Um, we feel it would have been more of a plant nursery rather than a garden centre. Um, so this shows you 1947, 1999, there were greenhouses, polytunnels um, on the site. And it, it would look like sort of this area of the <coughs> site was once a more sort of formal garden um, for the applicant's building. It appears sometime in the history um, it was divided off. This was sort of operated so separately, um, but it's since been rejoined, and now everything um, in that planted boundary um, belongs to the applicant. So again, slightly more recent photos. So the greenhouses um, can still be seen. But there are less polytunnels on the site. Um, so that's that's the end of the presentation. So I've just put that one up there so you can um, sort of compare the clusters of lodges that tend to go in the open areas. There will be lodges here um, and then four more lodges dotted in this area. So the recommendation um, is of approval. Um, it is, as you probably often hear officers say, a very finely balanced case. There are some conflicts of policies, as I mentioned in the report. Um, but it's felt that it's, it's a quite a, a relatively small-scale scheme. It aims to boost the local domestic year-round tourism. There is, as I mentioned, um, here, and then there's two down here. There is an existing holiday business use on the site, um, and there is the <coughs> former nursery to consider. So on balance, that's why um, the recommendation is approval. Thank you. Thank you, Cheryl. Now we move on to the uh, public speakers. Can I call Mr. Mark Gilchrist forward, please? Chair. Sorry. Sorry, I, I do have a question for the officer. Oh. Could you just sure. point out sure. on the plan 
where the winter garden is going to be, please. Just waiting for it to come back up on the screen. Okay. Where's the mouse on? It's, can you see the mouse? Um, it's the top. It's the top. It's the top, it's the top pink yeah. building. Uh, yeah. I think you're moving up. So yeah. 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 Fantastic. Uh, thank you very much. Um, my name is Mark Gilchrist. I'm a consultant physician at Torbay Hospital. I've got two young children. We live 250 metres from the site. I'm a parent governor at a school nearby. Um, and I'm delighted to be here to, to represent the local community and their, their views on this development. I would like to start by just going back to a development back in 2014, the Sawmill Solar Farm, a major development where the community was consulted ahead of time with public meetings and there were no objections from any private households uh, to that development. If we come to this development, there were no prior public meetings for what is quite a major development in the area. And what we have is 67 objections, I think, from the local community, and they are unanimous. There is no support for this in the local community. And when we look at the, the application, we feel that the council has been presented with an application that is riddled with omissions, with errors, and baseless assumptions. I think you can see from the handout that uh, some of my friends and neighbours have put together that there are real concerns about the traffic. Those pictures don't really give you a true uh, understanding of what the access to that site is like. In some of the mitigations, it talks about providing cycle storage. Um, the gradients either side of that access are in excess of 20%. That is out of reach to the casual cyclist and certainly out of reach to the more sedentary individual that's apparently being targeted by these holiday lets. Um, the traffic count that many assumptions are based on was conducted in February 2021 during a period of COVID lockdown. Any calculations arising from that are not reliable, particularly when you consider February 2021 in lockdown versus a busy holiday period, April to October. Um, the notion that somehow traffic will be reduced from a site that's not had any commercial activity in 15 years is also a little bit hard to understand. If we move on to things related to ecological considerations and sustainability, the Council gave a very clear steer uh, in pre-application advice to do with things like DNA surveys of ponds on adjacent sites looking for great crested newts. Instead, what we have is somebody looking at some satellite pictures saying it's probably not hospitable to amphibians. We've got a request from the council pre-application for bat surveys between April and October. What we've been presented with is April to June. And if we look at the bat survey that's been provided, we know that there are multiple species of very light sensitive bats who are foraging, commuting, roosting in areas where these lodges are going to be. And we cannot see that the, necessarily, the necessary legislative requirements in terms of light mitigation, particularly from the lodges themselves and from the traffic, have been met in this regard. I think the community also has significant concerns about the ongoing management plans for the site. So many of the mitigations in the final report uh, from the planning department uh, seem to rely on the 24-7 presence of the applicant to manage things like the lights out on barbecues and fire pits at 11, the day-to-day -day checking in, ferrying uh, staff around to reduce traffic. Um, and I think the existing holiday lets have been used in support of the application. And if we look at TripAdvisor reports for uh, how they are managed and the impact there, what we see is but seven reports, all of which give it a one out of five rating, where customers feel that 
their expectations have not been met, and they describe properties in a state of chronic disrepair. I cannot see that expanding this property base by seven to tenfold is going to improve this situation. So the local community feel that many of the representations and surveys that have been done uh, need to be re-looked at, preferably by independent uh, providers. And if you feel that you cannot reject this application, uh, following that, we would ask that there are stringent conditions placed, particularly around the management, particularly around environmental consideration that are measurable, enforceable, and would lead to the closure of the site if they were not met. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sorry, right, okay. Now an opportunity for the supporter, Mrs. Diane Neary, to come up and have five minutes. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Diane Neary. Uh, I'm the owner of Obelisk Gardens, uh, the property which is the subject of the planning application before you today. I have been a resident in Mamhead for the last 32 years, since 1990, and live at Magnolia Lake, previously known as The Grange. My husband and I purchased Obelisk Gardens in June of 2007, almost in self-defense, as the previous owners were very noisy and used a lot of heavy plant and machinery, JCBs and diggers, alongside the plant nursery that they operated. The property was in a very run-down and dilapidated state. Regrettably, my husband died and life changed. My son lives and works with me here, and we set about together to make improvements to Obelisk Gardens. We created a holiday letting business using the existing three buildings on the property, improving and re refitting them out, and then we incorporated two cottages from the old stable building at Magnolia Lake and have five cottages. Eleven years later, a successful holiday letting business catering for a 50-plus age group uh, has been established. Uh, the, the, the guests enjoy countryside and love to come to Devon and revisit old haunts or simply just relish the peace, tranquility and country surroundings. The cottages have proved to be very popular, despite what has been said previously. I do have a very good rating for the, the holiday occupancy. Uh, the age group that come are, are very happy with the environment. It's quiet and peaceful. We have improved obelisk gardens and planted a considerable number of specimen trees and shrubs and cleared away a huge amount of derelict nursery fitments and 18 eyesore polytunnels. Adding luxury holiday lodges was a natural extension of the already popular letting business. Sensitively installed, they would also complement the environment and not damage the surroundings. Holiday lodges do not entail building construction and are not considered permanent buildings. Retaining one of the largest of the greenhouses as a winter garden will create a local a focal point and place for visitors to additionally enjoy. I envisage the lodges to be in the colours of the countryside, muted browns and greens, complemented by landscaped floral and evergreen shrubs and plants, plus more trees, all of which would create more attraction and habitat for wildlife, birds, bats and other important insects and local wildlife. We are beekeepers, a bit green, and don't allow the use of pesticides or other countryside killers. 
Due to the contour of the land, and, and very little, if anything, is seen from outside the boundaries, which are heavily wooded, so such a development would in no way upset the surrounding countryside or blight the view. Our biggest contribution to the need for carbon reduction is to ensure our groundworks, drainage and lodge spots are as carbon neutral as possible. Lodges themselves are constructed to the latest standards and already incorporate carbon neutral principles wherever possible. There will be provision for rainwater to be collected for plants, lodges will be fitted with solar panels, electric charging points and bicycle storage. Um, the, the guests that come to stay, believe it or not, do bring their bikes and they do like to use them, so we have to give them storage. We personally are and will be in charge of overseeing all aspects of the development. Living adjacent to the park, we will be ensuring the location retains its countryside atmosphere and is a valuable addition to the area. We were encouraged to receive the approval of English Heritage in, in the proposal and to hear that they considered it would be an improvement to the property. So I, I hope you look upon us favourably. We, we do have some very nice ideas that we'd like to incorporate. And thank you for listening. Um, at this stage, it would be the, the opportunity for the ward member to comment, but unfortunately, Councillor Connor is not able to be with us today. Sorry. Yeah. So now we go into the debate members. Oh, yes, sorry, Councillor Hook, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, can I um, just maybe have some clarification on some of the points that have been raised by um, the objectors? So, um, a, you know, a bit of commentary from officers on um, the fact that there was, I, I understand if it's a major application, there should be um, public consultation in the local community beforehand, and that wasn't carried out. So, some commentary on that, please. Um, Some commentary on the management of the site and um, the idea that it will be the owner next door. Is that an assumption that um, it will be the owner next door that is going to be regularly um, patrolling the, the site and, and dealing with management issues? Um, or, or is that going to be conditioned? I assume it can't. So can I have a bit more on the management of the site to ensure that it does operate in, in the way that's been suggested it will. Um, can I have a bit of information about the BAT surveys, the fact that it should have been um, April to October, but was only April to June. Um, and in terms of landscape assessment, um, the fact that a new landscape assessment wasn't carried out, um, can we assume, I mean, or can you let us know that um, the, the lodges that have been removed have been removed from the area where it felt there was a problem and therefore that is why you haven't asked for a, another landscape um, assessment? Thank you. Yeah, okay, so to answer those, if the landscape assessment, if I take that one first, um, yeah, it's correct. A new um, landscape assessment wasn't requested, um, which would generally be standard when a scheme is being reduced. Obviously, it was quite significant, uh, significantly reduced from 24 lodges down to 14. Um, the removal of the 10 lodges from the top corner of the site wasn't done for landscape reasons anyway. Um, that was done purely because they were the... Um, closest to the registered park and garden, Historic England had an objection on that basis. Um, there has never been a landscape um, objection to this, so there was no need um, to get them to revise the, the landscape work on the lower number of um, lodges. Um, in terms of the bat surveys, um, they were carried out by um, professional ecologists our um, biodiversity officer has reviewed all of those documents. She's carried out the um, South Ham's SAC uh, 
habitats regulations screening um, is satisfied with the level of information proposed. Um, what I would say is in terms of the surveys, uh, the guidelines saying April to October, that is just guidelines. It's not a, a set rule. Um, quite often, if ecologists can get enough information to make an informed decision by doing less surveys, um, they will do. There's no need to you know, go to considerable expense to um, do additional surveys that won't reveal anything extra. Um, in terms of site management, um, the applicant is the owner who has just spoken and has confirmed she's living there. Uh, you will see on um, condition 19, um, on page 3 of the report, um, we are proposing um, there is a condition for a management scheme to be submitted. Um, and a lot of the, the issues that concern the objectors would be dealt with under the site licence as well, not in terms of planning. Um, and I think the final point you raised was the consultation. Um, now, I don't, my understanding is there wasn't um, sort of public consultation or events held prior to submission, but as I mentioned in the report, you know, the application has been with us. Um, it was submitted in 2021. So there has, as is evidenced by the objection, there has been you know, quite significant opportunity for people um, to make their views held, and they have done so. Thank you. If I can just follow up on that one, Chair. Okay. Um, whilst consultation pre-application is encouraged, you know, on any application of any scale, we can't we can't turn it away if that doesn't happen. Um, it's it's the onus is on the applicants to engage positively with their community, but um, particularly of something of this nature, where it is major, really by virtue of site area only, rather than um, uh, because of the number of dwellings or the amount of floor space that's being developed. Because caravan um, sites are are a use of land rather than built development, um, we wouldn't. Uh, insist on any upfront public consultation taking place. Thank you. Any other members like to comment? <coughs> yes, I, I would just. I was just looking at the highways uh, aspect of this, paragraph 6 6. Um, it, it is very narrow. There will be a lot of traffic uh, coming uh, from visitors to the area who are not familiar with the narrow roads. Um, it does seem as though Devon County are satisfied uh, with the access and the traffic arrangements. I wonder if there's been any further comments by the people who live in the area about um, traffic concerns and highway impact uh, on these narrow lanes. Is there any further concerns about that being expressed? Would the officer like to respond to that, please? Yeah, I can. I mean, I'm not sure what you mean by further. I think it, it is one of the key areas of concerns that has been raised by objectors. Yes, well, I, I appreciate it. I know the area, but this is the first time mm. I'm on the committee, and I just want to make sure that all aspects are being considered here. It yeah. is a lovely area. It's a tranquil area, but the access is really very narrow. And um, when you look at the number of vehicles that will be coming up and down uh, to access the site, people who are strangers to the area, uh, then there could be, we, we could foresee some difficulties uh, with, with, with traffic and people not being familiar with the area. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. And any other members like to comment? Chris, Councillor Clarence was momentarily before you, Councillor Yeah, Jim, thank you. you very much, um, Chairman. Uh, could you remind us, please, uh, the criteria uh, that designates this? This is an area of great landscape value, AGLV. What's the criteria? Uh, could, could we have the definition of that area, please? Uh, AGLV is a local landscape designation. It's not a national de landscape designation. Um, it does apply to our prettier areas, but the inclusion or exclusion of any particular area of the district from the AGLV has not been reconsidered since 2000. And it wasn't re-looked at in our 2014 plan. It was rolled forward from our previous plan. But clearly, this part of the countryside, so close to a registered park and garden, um, is a relatively important landscape. Um, it's not a national designation, so we don't have any a AONB. We don't have any Greenbelt in Teambridge, although Greenbelt isn't a landscape designation. Um, and this isn't part of a national park. So this is a, 
at the lower end of landscape designations. It's one up from countryside, but it's a local landscape designation. So it's not one that merits uh, a special consideration, notwithstanding the fact that we have policy EN2A that talks about giving, um, you know, being careful that we make good decisions in these areas. Um, which is why we had the LVIA work done and why the size of the scheme has been reduced um, to make sure that it didn't have an unacceptable impact on the registered park. I hope that helps. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't help. I'm sorry. I'm trying to get, tease out of you, please, if I may. Uh, I mean, uh, is it de if it's designated countryside or if it's delivered designated undeveloped coast. There are certain criteria in undeveloped coast which preclude development and what have you. And I, I want to see, I'm trying to tease out of you, please, if I may, what, what the criteria is for an ALGV. That's what I'm trying to say. I mean, it might just as well not have a designation if it's not... Does it preclude you from doing anything? Does it... No. it no, it doesn't. So the undeveloped coast policy in the local plan is really clear that development should not take place in the undeveloped coast unless it is for marine purposes or if it's a domestic extension or relatively minor development. The policy for the AGLV, thanks Cheryl, um, says that development, uh, to protect and enhance the area, development will be sympathetic and help conserve and enhance um, landscape and seascape character. So it's it gives us some criteria about um, you know, restoring the landscape, protecting wildlife and historic features, and maintaining the quality and avoiding visual impact through high quality design. You know, the criteria that are in the policy, we think are met. We are not in EN2 territory for undeveloped coast, which says uh, new development will be regarded as inappropriate except where. So in undeveloped coast, you start with a presumption against the development and you see if it fits. Um, that's not the same in, in this area. Thank you. So what you, what you say in this particular case is pretty meaningless. No, I'm not saying it's meaningless. I'm saying it's not the same as undeveloped coast. Okay, thank you. Sorry. Well, sorry, so, so, no, sorry, Councillor Dewhurst was actually before you, if you don't mind, yeah. Councillor Dewhurst. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yes, thank you. Uh, just a little concerned uh, around the, the lighting and how the minimisation of light uh, from the lodges themselves will be controlled in, in the sense that, obviously... Uh, you can control the outdoor lighting, um, but in, in terms of switching lights on and off or drawing curtains and the like, um, that, that's a much more difficult I issue. Um, I'd also like to know why the time of 11pm uh, for barbecues was, was a, why that particular time uh, was chosen, uh, please, and how the management scheme will ensure that there is actually uh, representation of the, um, of the management on site in the sense that they are two separate uh, areas from, from a planning point of view. Uh, and of course there is nothing um, to, to then stop the, uh, the owner um, either selling their house or, and, and moving on or, or, or selling the site. So the management scheme, um, there is the condition for that to be submitted. So if the applicant was to um, seek to discharge those conditions and submitted a management scheme that we felt didn't give enough um, assurances that it would be adequately managed, then we would not agree that condition. Um, there might be two separate areas... Um, but there is a there's a clear you can walk through so they are very much joined in effect. Um, but yeah, I take your point. We we can't stop the applicant from selling the site um, if they were to, to, to do that. Um, the 11 p.m. restriction on the barbecues that was um, at the suggestion of the environmental health team. 
Um, they had a look at the application and given, um, I think, the nearest neighbouring property is 250 roughly metres away. They didn't feel there was significant concern, but they suggested that that would be wise to put that condition on. Um, I mean, if you felt it was too late and it should be a little bit earlier, then we can discuss that. Uh, thanks. So it, I, I asked, I only asked that because it's usual uh, in the industry at the 10 o'clock, um, because obviously, you, you know, you can't just switch a barbecue off. Mm. Um, it, 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 it takes time, people move away and, and, and the like. Um, in, in, in terms of the, the lighting, I, I'm still just a little concerned um, that even though we would be managing the lighting out on site uh, to, to, to mitigate lighting impact um, on, on local species, not just bats, but of course insects and the like. Um, but if there's somebody there who, who wants to sit in their living room, for instance, with the curtains open, which of course in, on a nice summer evening, you could have the lights on uh, and, and the like in, into the night. What, what is to, to stop that? that happening um, in, in, in terms of, of the local management. And in terms of the local management, as, as I think we're all aware, the major issue with any kind of uh, holiday type of thing out in the countryside it, it is, is noise and, and impact on, on neighbours. And um, it, having the two separate parts of the, uh, of, of the site does does give me concern. Uh, I'm, I'm not necessarily sure that the people coming to something like this would be the type of people who had wild parties at three o'clock in the morning, but one never knows. Uh, and uh, and of course, with this quiet rural location, that would have an impact. Yes, please. Please do, yes. Um, yeah, yeah, I we do take your point um, and concerns on that. In terms of the lighting, um, as I mentioned, the Council Biodiversity Officer has carried out the South Hams SAC Habitats Regulations um, screening. Um, there is a question in that, which is um, disturbance from new illumination causing bats to change the use of an area. Um, she, she screened that out as a no um, if I just read out what, it's, what she said, the South Ham's planning guidance advises that in the landscape connectivity zone, impacts from new illumination are only likely to have a significant effect on the South Ham SAC greater horseshoe bat population, where the loss, damage or disturbance would be at a landscape scale, affecting a network of potential commuting routes. And then she goes on to assess it as um, proposal site is a single landscape compartment equivalent to a single field, with a good network of alternative linear routes on all sides, so she was satisfied um, that with the land, um, sorry, with the lighting condition that she requested, um, it wouldn't have an impact on the bats. You know, if if a bat was to fly sort of down the middle of the site and somebody put a light there, they can move over, and they'll you know they'll they'll sort of fly around it. It's not as if it's completely you know floodlighting the whole area picking up a sort of wall for the bats so she wasn't concerned about that in, in, in which case John, I'm happy to propose I sit down <coughs> sorry it, chair in which case I'm happy to propose as, as sit down ok thank you Thank you. Three other councillors have indicated they would like to speak. Sylvia Russell first, followed by Councillor Nuttall and then Councillor Clarence. Thank Clarence. you, Chairman. As a Tynmouth councillor, obviously there has been a lot of interest in development to the north of Tynmouth. And one of the reasons why developers is resisted because of the impact and, the, and the, onto the views of the ex-estuary. And um, so far we've resisted uh, uh, applications for development at that high point at North Tynmouth. Now, um, if we can have an objection from Tynmouth, this is Mamhead, much closer to the ex estuary, and it seems to me that perhaps the residents' concerns are valid and should be taken into consideration to have a, a development of this size uh, being expanded. I know it's the, the development is there already, but it's obviously going to be developed and enhanced 
to a greater degree than it is now, with a lot more traffic and a lot more activity going on in, in this really what is a lovely remote area. Thank you, Councillor Russell. Councillor Nuttall. Uh, thank you, Chair. Now, I'd like to ask a question about compliance with policy. In, in the report, you refer to policies S1, S9, S12, and you say there is some conflict with those policies. Another reading of it would say there's significant conflict with those policies. How concerned should we be about considering approving an application that, that contravenes national policy to that extent? Thank you. Um, I mean, I wouldn't say it's significant conflict. Um, if you turn to uh, paragraph 4.4 in the report, where I um, reproduce policy S1, um, it conflicts with some parts of it. Um, obviously, the accessibility um, isn't very good. The road safety is not felt to be a problem, so it doesn't conflict with that. Yes, you could say it conflicts with access to services and facilities. Um, but it, it broadly conforms with the rest of the policy. So it, it's, you know, it, you have to look at the local plan and the MPPF and sort of take them as a whole. Um, again, if there is some policy conflict, which is what we've done here, so we have identified there is some harm in effect, um, but the, the development satisfies all the other policies. It does bring some, um, albeit sort of small scale benefit um, taking into account the, the existing former use of the site. That's why in this case um, it's felt that that small policy conflict wasn't fatal to the scheme and in fact the benefits outweigh that harm. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Clarence. Uh, through you, thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Through you, may I draw members uh, um, to pol um, 411 uh, EC11? To support the sustainable expansion of the tourism industry, additional tourist accommodation includes self-catering and service accommodation. Campsites and caravans will be acceptable in principle within adjoining settlement limits. Does it really meet this criteria? That's what I'm saying. A uh, is to expand or improve the existing tourist locations. B, support expansion or improvement of an existing, uh, existing tourist attraction. Provide a new campsite or caravan site. And D, which is interesting, involve the appropriate conversion or change of use of a permanent and soundly constructed building. Well, these are new buildings. I can't understand why uh, they're not of a caravan-type nature. Having ha ha have a major development hoisted on us in Shalden in a campsite, these holiday lodges that we've inspected on that particular campsite have to sit on a very lightweight chassis to meet the definition of a caravan. Uh, the, these uh, uh, lodges uh, I'm talking about are at the campsite at uh, Coastview at Shalden. So they had to comply with sitting on a, a chassis with two wheels to make them a caravan. Yet here we see the construction of what I call to complete tourist, uh, complete chalets here. Uh, and are they really meeting the, the criteria in EC11? That's what I'm asking. Because it all revolves around this definition, I believe, of what is an actual caravan. And we have had... Uh, solicitors on that case, I believe, at Teambridge, uh, or, uh, and th th that, that's quite a contentious issue, I would suggest. Am I correct in my assumptions? Thank you, Councillor Clance. Would the officers like to respond, please? I'm, I'm happy to. Cheryl and I both love a caravan, I think. Um, so caravans are clearly defined in the Caravan Act, um, I think it's the 1968 version is the latest, and it's defined as something that can be moved in no more than two parts. It's capable of being disassembled and moved on, on the public highway in no more than two parts. There are also height, width, and length definitions. Um, if this development is brought forward in a way that doesn't comply with um, the Caravan Act, then it wouldn't be uh, within the, the realms of the permission. Um, 
the proposal that is before you is for a caravan site. If they choose to build something that isn't caravans, not only will that not be permitted, it will also most likely be sill liable. So every square metre of floor space that's developed on this site would be liable for sill at the countryside rate at £200 a metre. I wouldn't want to pay sill on the caravans here. At, well, it, now that it's indexed, it's closer to £250 a metre on floor space. So it's in the applicant's interest that this is very definitely a caravan site as it's put before you. Um, if you look at paragraph, I think it was four... Or was it 312 or 412? The paragraph no, underneath the one where the policy was set out. So Councillor Clarence brought us to 411. Paragraph 412 um, outlines the officer view that the proposal is compliant with EC11 because it's an existing tourist accommodation location with the, um, I think there's three holiday cottages, two? Uh, there's three on the site and then there's two next to the applicant's dwelling, so five existing. So there's a, a number of um, existing <coughs> tourist accommodation buildings nearby um, and this proposal is a caravan site. So in our view, it complies with EC11 or, um, to take Cheryl's point earlier, there's sufficient compliance with EC11 that reading the plan as a whole, we don't think there's a policy objection. I, I can only bring you to... Uh, and compromise is a new caravan site. So, you know, lodges don't, to me, I can't, I'm finding it hard to, to grasp the fact that, that a lodge is now a, a caravan, in effect. If you're calling it a new caravan site, how can you do that if, if they're actual lodges? My understanding is that it's possible to skin a caravan in a number of different ways. So the exterior treatment may be timber, it may be clad, uh, in a number of different ways, but it still fundamentally meets the definition of a caravan, which is that it's within the size limits and can be split into uh, no more than two parts to be transported on the public highway. Thank you. What, 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 what can I say, Chairman? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Hook. Thank you, Chair. Um, in my opinion, this is, and, and the officer's opinion, this is a, um, a finely balanced decision. I mean, there is harm that is caused and there is benefit, and it's how you weigh those two up. Um, in terms of the benefit, one, one of the benefits, I think, in terms of having separate tourist accommodation, I mean, we know there's a massive lack of affordable rented accommodation and um, places to purchase in our local rural community and coastal towns um, because of conversion to um, holiday accommodation. Um, these are separate, so they have that separate economic benefit without taking away local cottages and accommodation for our local population. That is one benefit. Um, there, there is a creation of jobs, a small creation of jobs, um, which there is dis some discussion about whether it's been overestimated. Um, but those people will need to travel to this location, um, which has a sustainability impact. Um, there's the benefit of the expenditure of those people that will stay here. So um, in spite of the, the idea that they will just pitch up at their lodge and stay there for a whole week, um, I imagine in reality they've got to go and buy some food to eat and they probably want to visit some local destinations and also maybe um, restaurants, cafes and pubs because that is what will ultimately benefit our economy. So in some ways we don't want them to stay exactly where they are, we want them to go and spend their money and in reality, given the location, they're going to be getting in their cars for most of those journeys, I would suggest. Um, so that again has a benefit and a disbenefit in terms of sustainability. Um, and I think it is how, how you weigh those up. And I think if you look at our policies, they, can, they pull in both directions. So although we've got EC11 that does obviously allow an, a new caravan um, site or an expansion of an existing one, the word in there does say acceptable in principle. So there are other policies that we need to consider alongside. And in fact, if you look at 318 in our local plan, it does say in the open countryside, various other policies will need to be considered in specific cases to ensure that proposals are acceptable. Um, and where it's not possible to fully mitigate impacts, permission may be refused. 
So there is that scope, even within EC11, to refuse this if we feel its negative impacts are greater than its positive impacts. And if we go back to S1 and S9 of our local plan, which people have referred to, then I think there probably is some fairly significant harmful impacts in terms of sustainability. So I think it's, you know, it's a close one. It's how we weigh up those up. I have to say I'm coming down on the side of um, refusing this one on terms of sustainability, um, uh, being a more negative impact than the small economic benefit that would um, accrue. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Hook, you, you've actually, are you proposing that this is um, refused? Yes. Yeah, so we've already had a proposal from Councillor Dewhurst that it was just approved as set out, but there isn't a seconder for that. I'll, I'll just comment, actually. Oh. Um, it's the heritage stuff. Uh, it's 4.78. I'm a bit confused on historic England originally uh, had a problem with this, and now it seems but they haven't, so I'm not quite sure. The bit in... It doesn't quite make sense to me. Do that, are they actually accepting it now with less, pe less lodges, or are they still have a problem with it? No, they are satisfied with it now. Mm. It, their only concern was the extent of the lodges, so they, they no longer object. Councillor Dewhurst. Thank, thank you, Chair. Just, just, just to come back, um, firstly, to just say my uh, my proposal, as set out, was to also have the ten o'clock barbecues. Um, but but we we have a policy which supports um, <coughs> caravan sites in the countryside, a and and by definition, uh, people come to the southwest and Devon in particular. Uh, for, for essentially two things. One is our, our wonderful coastline uh, and, and everything that that gives us, um, and, uh, and the other is our fantastic countryside. Uh, and in my view, the, the, the two are, are, are sort of in, inextricably linked in the sense that it is not possible to have something out in the countryside which has all the benefits of being there, the quiet, the rural location, uh, the, 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 the no people, in this instance, uh, the sort of forested location, and at the same time, have it completely sustainable. By definition, those people have got to come there. Uh, they're not going to come by train because there are no railway stations nearby and the like. Uh, they're going to come by car. Uh, they're family-style lodges, so the likelihood is they'll all come uh, as a family in a, in a car. Um, and, and, and so the principle of, of the fact that we support expansion and improvement of existing tourist attractions it is there, and also the fact we're we're providing a new campsite, uh, which is um, which is also uh, part of it. So mm. the uh, existing um, site is there with the existing uh, permanent buildings, uh, which are are let out, um, and the campsite are these lodges. Uh, I would also say that actually we have some fantastic uh, caravan lodge manufacturers here in this county uh, and, and indeed even in Teambridge, uh, an award-winning company here in Teambridge uh, and I'm sure the uh, applicant will be looking uh, at those in, in <coughs> preference to um, manufacturers from other parts of the country. So uh, there we go, that's Thank my you. words. Any, any other members like to comment? Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Yeah, I find this the most difficult uh, application to make a decision on. Uh, even the officer said it was finely balanced, mm. and, and I, I think it is. I'm not against creating a caravan site. Uh, I'm all for 
caravanning and encouraging tourism down here. But I think there are places to put caravans, and I'm not sure that this is the right one. I think the access is uh, um, troublesome, uh, and I think there'll be a lot of movement from it, which will cause a lot of disturbance. So on, on sustainability, I think I'm going to have to go against this application. I, I really do think it is very finely balanced, and I'm not sure this is the right place to expand, expand a caravan site. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor, are, are you second in the application? Sorry, the reference made by. Yes, yeah, you are. Sorry. Second the proposal, the sorry. Propo I thought it was a direct negative to the original proposal, but that didn't get a seconder, did it? No. no so it then no. I'll second the refusal. So, of seconded, the seconded by Councillor Coolclough. Any other members like to comment at all? Please do, yes. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, think, I think I agree with Councillor Dewhurst um, that uh, this application is finely balanced, but I think that there are benefits um, that, that outweigh to our tourist industry. Um, it is implicit in the fact that we are a rural district that sometimes there will be a need for some development in, in rural areas. And I know that we regularly talk about... Um, uh, precedent not really being a thing in planning and that what we want to try and achieve is consistent decision making so they are a couple of years old but I wanted to remind members um, uh, of a couple of decisions that we made in the north of the district at Springfield and Fingal Glen so they were both uh, holiday lodge schemes in 2019 I've just been trying to look them up um, uh, so one was expanding um, the Fingal Glen golf course through the inclusion of some static caravans and then I think the other was conversion from uh, touring caravan to static caravan site um, and also the approval that was given for the development of some holiday cottages at Dornfield in Ipplepen. So each of those sites was um, uh, in countryside locations. I'm not sure if they're in AGLV or not and um, there are additional complications but the, the way that we presented the sustainability point um, in relation to those sites was um, both the benefit of boosting our domestic tourist industry, so making sure that we have a good quality um, tourist accommodation available in the UK, uh, potentially providing more alternatives to people than, than getting on an aeroplane and going abroad. So if we have good quality tourist accommodation in the UK, whilst you, whilst you might need to get in a car to get there, it's better that you get in a car and go on holiday in Devon than that you get in a, on an aeroplane and, and go to Alley County or, or wherever might suit your tastes. Um, uh, I also very much agree with the point that Councillor Hook made about making sure that holidays take place in specialist holiday accommodation. Um, we were having a conversation earlier this week about the, the real difficulty if you have a, a bar on tourist accommodation um, with the planning system that we have at the moment, the way that that would, um, whilst domestic tourism is being boosted, uh, as it has been over the last few years, that really does put pressure on our on our housing stock. So, um, I, whilst I understand the concerns that have been raised in relation to the accessibility and therefore the uh, inherent sustainability in terms of the way that people will travel to get to this site, uh, in our view, um, look, look, looked at at a more macro scale rather than micro scale of, of simple accessibility to this site, we think that the, the sustainability benefits are there. Um, obviously, it's for you guys to, to make the decision and, and vote how, how um, uh, you, you think the balance comes down. But I just wanted to remind you of those, that Fingal Glen decision and um, the Dornerfield one as well. Thank you. No, look, Councillor Hook first, if I may, please. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Um, from memory, isn't Fingal Glen next to a main road? Um, and I'm not sure about the other one. Right, OK. So, so um, this obviously isn't near to a main road. It's several narrow mm. lanes to get to it. I mean, you know, I totally accept this is finely balanced. I think we all accept this is finely balanced. And it, um, you, you know, I don't think Devon and our countryside want to absorb every possible foreign holiday that exists. Um, it's, they're, they're two different things. They're, 
yes, mm. we need to try and stop people taking foreign, foreign holidays by plane or minimising the number they do and encouraging domestic holidays. I don't think we can play that out through this planning application necessarily. Um, we need to look at this and the impact it's having on sustainability and car journeys within Teambridge on some very narrow highways. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Russell. Chairman, we've talked about consistency of decision-making in, in sensitive areas. Well, <coughs> we've just had refused uh, an application on a brownfield site in the Teen Estuary, uh, which is obviously a site of, of national importance from an environmental point of view. So here we are now uh, looking at uh, expanding a site in an area of natural beauty and in, in the site of the, T of the X estuary. Um, so does one balance the other out? And is there any consistency in some of the decisions that we're making? Thank you. Thank you. I've just, just been passed the note. Um, decision must be made based on the information contained in the report and that presented to the committee not other decisions, sorry, not other decisions that may have been determined. Can I just have clarification on that, please? Sorry. Yeah, Chairman, yeah. That, that, that's correct. Yeah. That's correct. Members of the committee need to consider the report that's presented to them, the information in addition to what's contained in the report that's been presented to them mm. to the day. Obviously, the responses to questions raised, and they... Um, are here to make a decision um, based on that information. I would urge caution about getting sidetracked in respect of what decisions may or may not have been made in respect of other applications. Thank okay. You. okay, thank you for that. So we've had a proposal from Councillor Dewhurst that this is um, uh, accepted as set out, but that wasn't seconded. So we've had no proposal from Councillor Hook that it's refused, and that's been seconded by Councillor Colclough. So before we go to the vote, I think we need to define the reasons for refusal. So Councillor Hook. Thank you. Thank, is it on? Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, yeah, so I'd like to refer to policy S1A... Um, um, and C, predominantly, and then po policy S9, um, sustainable um, transport. Um, I haven't, I'm not, I'm re trying to read it now, obviously it's quite long, but the relevant sections of policy S9 to this proposal. For example, reduce the need to travel um, and then in particular A, obviously not near public transport, cycling and walking, I don't think are realistic transport modes for most journeys from this site. What's that? Yep, those two policies, thank you. And Councillor Nuttall mentioned S12 as well. So, okay. Okay, thank you. So we'll go to the vote then. For, can, for Chair, can we just clarify yeah. clarify what members are voting on? Councillor Jackie Hook's proposed refusal yeah. for the uh, policy she's just outlined. Um, I understand you, you Councillor Nuttall mentioned a policy, but you're not including that. And that's been seconded by Councillor Clough. Yes. So that's what we'll be going to the vote on. Okay, members, thank you. And, and we are voting for refusal rather than against. Okay, so can we go to a roll call, please? Thank you, Chair. Councillor Bradford. Four. Councillor Clarence. Four. Councillor Colclough. Councillor Cox. Four. Councillor Dewhurst. Councillor Hook. Four. Councillor Kurzweil. Four. Councillor Nuttall. Councillor... Uh, Councillor Petherick. Four. Councillor Russell. Thank you. So with one exception, that's carried, isn't it? Yeah. Chair, that's carried, okay. yeah, nine to one. Thank okay. you.
So, moving on now to item seven on the agenda, which is major decision summary, which is pages 39 to 40. And there aren't any determinations being made for this period, so we can swiftly move on to item eight, which is appeals decisions. Would the officers like to talk us through these, please? Um, thank you, Chair. Just, I mentioned this one last month. It had just come in. Um, the Hill Drive St Mason Lane decision uh, that came in uh, has been dismissed. Um, it's relevant as that is an allocated site, um, part of the DA2 major allocation. Um, but there were a number of difficulties with that one, including um, biodiversity layout and, and drainage matters, which, which we often consider in relation to applications at Dawlish. Um, uh, the other ones uh, were relatively um, small-scale um, officer decisions, so um, nothing particular to note. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. Uh, any members got any comments at all, or are we happy to note those decisions? Okay, thank you very much indeed. So that concludes the meeting for today, so thank you for attending. And Merry Christmas to everybody. Thank you. <laughs>